Is, is that a motion? <laughs> I move that the, the white stake location for the winery sign uh, be accepted by the board. Second. So all in favor of moving the winery sign to the lo point located by the white stake? You got it. Thank you very, <laughs> Thank very you. much. You're welcome, Thank Christy. you. Thank I you. truly, truly appreciate it. You're very truly, welcome. truly appreciate it. Uh, okay, now we have the Omasta sign. So, my brief history I'm not sure, I can't remember when the Omasta sign came into play. If it came before the board or not. I'm not sure. I know Jimmy's right, he did. Mm -hmm. And we allowed it as an interim measure while we basically threw around and shoot up and spit out a tourist policy sign or a tourism directional sign uh, policy. So now that that's in play, we've sent them the information that they should come into, you know, basically um, compliance with the policy. Um, but what's happening right now with Mr. Massa, this is probably starting one of his busy seasons right now, the fall, going into uh, Thanksgiving and well, the, and the Christmas season is really the big thing because a lot of people come out of town and they haven't been there before. So, <laughs> so, so, so the question that I pose is that um, we, we've asked that the Hickory Dell Farm apply for a tourism directional sign to come in compliance with the board and their policy. Um, we haven't seen the application. I just gave it to John tonight, the application. But in the interim period, we will allow his old sign to go up as long as he's moving forth with a new application. Is the old, would the new sign be where the winery sign is? It would be. It would be attached to the same set of signs. Would it take that long or just? Well, the problem is we have to buy, all right, in the big, somewhere around 2000, we, we found out that you could put up a sign on the side of the road for uh, farm stand. So we, we, we thought we had to deal with the state because we thought Route 66 was a state road. But State said that it was a town road. We had to deal with the town. We actually had Bob Dossel when he's on the board. I came before the board at that point. He came out with me, and we looked at the thing and, and both determined where that sign went up originally was a suitable location. And after we met with him, we came to the board, and it was accepted because he, you know, he explained that he'd done a site visit, said this didn't seem to be a problem with anybody, and so that's when it went in. Since that time, it's been knocked down once by some vehicle, it was put back up again. Now, I don't remember if it got put in the exact same spot. And then about two or three weeks ago, I also realized it wasn't there. And so then we did the hunt and found out it was at the DPW. So, I mean, initially we did go before this board with that sign. And I think this, this, the regulations, it was, had to be a certain size that we, that we fell under. Now that Mm -hmm. The thing is bigger, so that would mean we'd have to buy another sign to, to be bigger to comply with, you know. Well, the, the, the city would actually get the sign. That's part of the application process. Oh. The city takes care of the sign, they maintain it, they pay for it, they install it. So it's basically the application fee, and then the city takes it from there. All right. You just need the language. All right, because I mean, I, this is, I mean, I was just handed an envelope tonight, so yeah. I don't know exactly what the policy is, but that's... That's basically how we got to the point where we are now. What's the application fee? Uh, I think it's five hundred dollars. But if they already had a, a sign up, yeah. If they already had a sign up, did they have to pay to have another sign put up? Well, that's a good question for the board because it doesn't meet your, the policy that you implemented. Uh -huh. The sign is not part of that new policy now. Except that it was grant wouldn't it have been grandfathered in because it was well, already That's there? your call. I mean, that wasn't our the way we set the policy up. Which grand yeah. grandfathering in We wanted time. to bring everyone into conformity and not have everyone kind of with their own with their own sign. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. kind of Thank you, Terry. Um, Councillor Labarge. I received a call from Fayo Masta at work asking me as her city councilor if I knew where their Hickory Dell Farm sign was. I said, what are you talking about? She said, it's gone. So I went on the corner house, Joe Samburas, went through his whole property looking for it. I then emailed Ned and told him that there was a problem 
we we could not find Faye's sign. So Ned told me he was going to do um, go through his internal department, mm -hmm. whatever, to see if he could find out where the sign was. Apparently, an employee from the Board of Public Works did find it leaning against the winery sign. I don't know how all this has happened, but I have to agree with Rosemary. I have great concerns that somebody goes through the process way back, just like we do with anything else in planning, or zoning, or anything like that, you're grandfathered in. I don't know why they have to go through this whole process when they did come through the board, and it wasn't Bob Dostal, it was Jim Dostal. Oh, Jim. <laughs> okay, way back, who helped them get that sign going through the process through the Board of Public Works? So I have great concerns of somebody already being approved, now making them go back because there is a tourism policy, and they're going to have to follow the rules when the sign is here at the Board of Public Works. Mm -hmm. Thank you. That's my question. Thank you. So... If we, if we simply, I mean, how long does it take to go through the process to get approved for a sign? I, my sense is he would have, uh, be approved right away. And typically, the, the way the process was left with the board that we did on an individual basis yeah. until we did enough and the, the, that the board felt comfortable with the staff that we would just do them without board voting on them. Mm -hmm. So, so my, the standards are up. The standards have been located. Yeah. It's just a matter of, it seems like, ordering a sign. So, but refresh my mind. I mean, I know we were going for consistency and we wanted to make sure everything was consistent, but we weren't going to go around town and get everybody to take down their existing signs, were we? Yes. I mean, for example, Jim's Variety, the explicit agreement was that this is just temporary while we finish. For Jim's Variety, because yeah. that was a new one. Right, I'm that's talking different. about throughout the whole city, all the tourist signs. since the mid-90s, and I don't remember those. There was no policy. There, there was no procedure. I think Jim went out as a good neighbor and <clears throat> said, John, that was Terry, pretty good to me. Well, I know I came but, here. Let me just explain to you about Jim's <coughs> variety. When we had the reconstruction of Route 66 occurring, mm -hmm. there was a big problem, and that was because that road became a problem for both the Amastus Farm, and also for Jim's Variety, because I, they have called me several times in regards of losing business. The same with Jim's Variety. Anyways, the sign was put up to help them to get people to come into their business. Then they got hit with the recession, all right? And that store is up for sale right now. And this is the only pop store we have. I mean, it's like, I don't think... They're going to like the idea of spending more money again when they've lost a tremendous amount of money. Yeah. So I think we need to look at the big picture here, out in the rural areas or whatever, okay, that businesses are extremely important here in the city of Northampton. I'm talking about our local farmers. <clears throat> this family works hard seven days a week, okay? They're trying to survive, and, you know, it's growth food in Northampton, and this is what they're doing, and they do so much on this farm. And to see a farmer and their family struggling, and now trying to get back on their feet, and now they're being told, well, you went through the process, which they did, okay? Now they're going to have to go ahead and pay $500 and have a tourism sign put up. I have a problem with this. Any discussion at the board? Well, my biggest thing is that when we got the sign initially, there was a, what it, what, standard a standard size that we could use, and we couldn't go above that in so many letters. And that's why the sign was that size. So, you know, now you're saying that's not the standard. So I don't know, you know, that's the frustrating part. You know, so $500 for another sign after we, you know, spent a few hundred dollars for the first one. and. Do you have any idea what the cost of the, the, the sign 
placard itself is without the standards and the I don't remember offhand, but I believe the the winery signs were around I think they were just about two hundred dollars each. I see a glimmer of a compromise. <laughs> well, yeah, I don't know. I don't know if it's acceptable, but whether there's a way we could reduce the fee for some of them in existing sign. I I mean I, I clearly see the merit to the city in having uniformity of signs and having multiple signs in one location as opposed to different locations. Right. I mean, we, we just went through this whole safety issue of what does a driver see when they're going down the road and how many signs do you want them to read. Mm -hmm. And if that safety issue has merit, then it has merit here. Meaning combining them is a good idea. Right. Yeah, that's right. Combining and if, them if having idea. a sign here and a sign there is not a safety issue, then... But wasn't it on the same sign as Jim's variety? Yes, Bayo Masters was Well, ours was there initially, and he talked to us, and then he came down here, and it said if there's room on the post, you can put it there. Right. right. Basically, that's how that worked. Right. <coughs> but the issue is also, if do we know how many other tourist signs there are in the city, and are we going to ask other people to take their signs? I mean, the ones that come to mind are the Winery, Hickory Dell, and Jim's. Those are the ones that... There aren't many. Yeah. I recall. Yeah. So, Michael, could you... Would you make a... Would you feel comfortable making a motion that we... As an accommodation? I mean, I hear what you're saying, Marianne. Um, as an accommodation, the standards are up. The site, the site visits are done. The trench permit has been Yeah. yeah. I'll make that motion. I move that uh, the board reduce the fee for I think just the Omasta and the Jim's variety store signs to the actual cost of the sign itself um, because um, well that's the end of the Second. All in favor of this accommodation for the two businesses that have existing signs that will have to be taken down? Aye. No one opposed? Okay. That, that seems like a pretty nice... All right, so I guess my question is now, if they have to make a new sign, are we talking weeks? Are we talking a month? Or, you know, I'll talk well with Laura that tomorrow. She did the last year of the sign. I don't think it was more than a couple weeks to get the signs here. But as part of that motion, are you looking that they would be able to put up their old sign existing in the interim period for two to three weeks? Let's, this should happen real quickly, right? I, yeah, but I'm willing to make that motion just in case. I think so, too. You need to protect it, them. It took a long time. Oh, it did? Okay. I think yeah. it I, did. I, and I don't know if that was because it was the first one, and we were going back and forth, but it was longer than a couple okay. of weeks. Okay, fair enough. They yeah. also oh, a, a trench enough. permit. They're, they're going to waive the trench permit. Well, there is no trench permit because the signs are existing. Okay. So they're just attaching to existing posts that are already went through the trench permit process. It's more the lag time to order a sign. Yeah, okay. So if we need another motion on that, I'll make that. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. So, John, what I'll do from you is the exact language you want to have on your sign. Okay, I mean... And we can get a, an idea of what that cost will be. Yeah, I mean, I'm sure it's just going to be pretty much the same thing. You just pick Riddell and, you know, an arrow. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Nothing too... Well, I'll send an email to you and Faye, and we can talk about that, okay? All right. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you again very much. I hope you do. Congratulations. Okay. Um, no legal advice on that, Terry. We didn't have to tap into the legal. The legal. Well, you still here. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you should have. Right? So, um, at a previous meeting, uh, it was asked that Alan Seawall come and talk to us about the ins and outs of open meeting laws. Yeah. Thank you, uh, Terry. Um, be happy to answer any questions you might have specific questions. Um, whenever I talk about the open meeting law, the first thing I want to do is uh, is just to sort of give you some some.
some background on the intent of the Open Meeting Law, which I'm sure you all know, but I'll say anyway, that um, you know the, the interest is open government. The interest is in making sure that what the deliberations that this board and every governmental body has um, are done in open session, um, in full and plain view of not only the public, but the press, and anybody else who's interested. Um, and toward that end, um, the statute, which was recently amended in 2010, effective in 2010, um, requires that any public body, you're clearly a public body as a, as a board here, um, any deliberation among the quorum of you happen in uh, on any matter that's within your jurisdiction happen in a public session. That in order for the public session to be meaningful, there needs to be notice given to the public of when you're going to have these sessions and some uh, basic information presented in that notice um, so that anyone reading the notice would have a good idea of what it is you're going to discuss and deliberate upon. Um, so one of the changes that happened in the last uh, go round of changes is that all subject matters that the, the chair is, um, could reasonably anticipate being discussed at the meeting needs to be in an agenda posted at least 48 hours in certain public places um, in the city. Um, so, you know, the questions, uh, the most basic question, of course, is are you a public body? You are. Uh, the next uh, the next question that you ask yourself is whether um, you're going to engage in communications that constitute a deliberation, uh, whether what you're deliberating about is within your jurisdiction, and the last thing is whether you fall into any of the exceptions that would allow you to have um, an executive session or a private session. Um, you should know uh, that private sessions are, or executive sessions are only private for so long as the, the reason for the private session obtains, and as soon as uh, those reasons dissipate, whether it's discussing litigation or collective bargaining or whatever it is, um, whenever those, that purpose no longer uh, is valid, those minutes become public. So the idea here is open government, public proceedings. Um, the question of what is a deliberation? A deliberation is de de um, defined as an oral or written communication through any medium, including electronic mail, between or among a quorum of a public body on any business within its jurisdiction. Um, essentially, whenever a quorum of you meet and discuss this board's business, it needs to be done in open session. That's the rule of thumb. Um, there are some um, other things to think about. The things we are concerned about um, are smaller groups of you. Um, there are boards, and I don't know whether you do this, but form subcommittees, explicit subcommittees whose job it is to go out, investigate, gather information, bring back a recommendation. Classic sub subcommittees. Subcommittees, uh, unless they're a subcommittee of one, our public bodies, subcommittees have to have their uh, agendas posted just like this board does. All the same rules apply to subcommittees. Um, so, Alan, it's, it's the, the distinction as to whether the subcommittee is small enough to not constitute a forum is not a valid exception. Quorum. A quorum? S small enough so as to not constitute a quorum. Every, every public body has a quorum. And so when you when separate off, meet. so the, the only way that you could create a subcommittee, and it's not really a subcommittee because it's not a committee, is to send one person out on fact-finding. That person is not subject to the open meeting law because that person can meet with him or herself any time. Okay. Um, so quorum is not defined by numbers, but rather by one or more, or two or more people. A quorum is, unless there is an ordinance or a statute changing this, is a, a majority of the whole. So, if you're a seven-member body of four members, it would be a, a quorum. Well, that, four members, that but if you're a subcommittee of three people, then two would be a quorum. Okay. But I wonder if you're a quorum. What if you're a subcommittee of two people? Two is a quorum. One and a half. <laughs> <laughs> so, so, as an example, when you drove around the three of us, yeah. uh, looking at private ways. 
how would you do that in a public forum? That's that's where it gets really dicey for me. I, I can't imagine how you would drag around the entire city with you to look at it right away. But I'm just pointing out that was not a subcommittee, right? It was just mm -hmm. two people. But no, it was, it was a subcommittee. Yeah. Three people. Yeah. Yeah. So you were a Sorry. seven. Seven, seven, seven. seven. Yeah. So, number. So four is a quorum. Yeah. Right, but we, we were, it's, it was a private way subcommittee that went okay. to sort of Three survey. Of yeah. Meaning we wanted to just get a sense of what we really had. To right. T taking a view of private property is not a public meeting. It's one of the, the, uh, the exceptions historically. Um, so when the Zoning Board of Appeals goes into somebody's house to look at their house to see whether they're, they're going to approve an addition to the house, People aren't expecting that the entire town or city is going to come along with the zoning board uh, onto private property. So the public view, the, the view of private property is, is exempted. But when, um, uh, but obviously when you are meeting to discuss what you found on your view, uh, that is uh, a governmental body deliberating over a matter within yeah, your jurisdiction. That, that makes sense. I don't understand that. It was the what I was trying to imagine. How would you? Physically have an open meeting forum while traveling throughout the city in the course of no, you would. a few hours on several different evenings, as I recall. Chris, Alan, um, and you know, you, you can say I, I haven't thought about it, but given the fact that there is one example of um, examination of private property that is not a public meeting, can you think of other things that we might do in the course of our activities that would not be characterized as a public meeting? Um, there's not much that, that you as a group would do that's not a public meeting. Um, there are uh, bases for you as a public body to meet, as I said, in executive session. There are exemptions to the open meeting law uh, that would allow you to, to meet in private, but, uh, but generally you should um, uh, presume that any time a quorum, if you get together, it is a, a, uh, a meeting. Another that, example, and that is you know, the tours of various facilities. So we've had tours of the water treatment plant, the wastewater treatment plant. We've gone to the landfill. <coughs> I'll, I'll double check those, but I, I don't. I don't believe that those are public meetings uh, that need to be posted. They're really yeah. informational for the board. I mean, I, I can tell you that's what the purpose is. It's just so that we, when we're signing yeah. contracts, we have a sense of where, time, and place that's going to happen and what it looks like. Those wouldn't be subcommittees anyway. They'd be yeah, just the whole board. But so there's no the deliberation, I guess. It's just yeah. viewing the, the premises right. and <clears throat> asking questions about the water plant process. But but just be careful because <clears throat> just because all you're doing is taking in information doesn't mean that, that it's it's not a uh, it, it's it should, it's not an open meeting. Um, one of the things that that Ned and I have talked about that when 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 Ned invited me to the meeting, I asked him, well, tell me. Give me a heads up on on what might be an issue, yeah. and what Ned told me was uh, about meetings that you have with staff on budget issues, mm -hmm. and you break off into small groups. Right, um, and we were it, really careful to have less than three in our meeting. Well, three or less. Or less than four. Less yeah. than four yeah. Three or less. Yeah. Well, it is technically not a, su a subcommittee, um, but it it does raise the specter of another sort of communication that you need to be very careful about. And that's what we call serial communications. Mm -hmm. So when two of you go and meet with staff, and then the next two come in, and staff inadvertently says, well, that's interesting. When Rosemary was in, she asked the question, or she said, or she pointed out, you've just violated the open meeting law. Because now we're taking what you said and conveying it to two others, and now you've got four people hearing information about a matter within your jurisdiction. But is, is just hearing information deliberation? It's oral communication. Well, well, I thought the key word was deliberate. And a deliberation is any oral communication among a quorum on a matter within your jurisdiction. Even if nobody's listening. Even if nobody's listening. <laughs> <laughs> or, or we forget. Uh -huh. but then so, Alan, are you going to uh, circle back the emails you mentioned them briefly? Emails, yeah. um, emails are um, are communications. Explicitly in the statute, they are communications. <coughs> so sometimes, so, in my effort to persuade people or to kind of get people thinking about something, I might send everyone an email. Yeah. 
the the sending of the email is probably not an open meeting violation. The reply to the email is an open meeting violation. Once it gets replied to, particularly if it's replied to all, it's an open meeting violation. So my advice is um, to schedule by email to persuade each other in open session. Um, if uh, and I have seen this done quite a number of times. If, if you have something you want to share with the other board members, a document that's going to be important at your next meeting, send the document and explicitly state, do not reply to this, do not reply all, do not reply to each other, speak to each other about this. This is just for informational purposes for the meeting, and then that document has to go into the record of the public meeting. All the documents at the public meeting become part of the record. So, um, and I will say, I just want to circle back for one second to your two at a time meetings with staff. Um, I spoke to the Attorney General's office about this today, and they scratched their head a little bit about it. I scratched my head about it because um, while there is no subcommittee formed by this board to go out and do any investigation to to pr bring back, I'm sorry, I have my back. Uh, to bring back information to this board, um, it does raise concerns about what is actually happening behind closed doors, and um, it is something that is not consistent with the the whole spirit of open government that is embodied not only in in the open meeting law but in our best practices, um, and. Um, I, I asked the question, why couldn't everything you do be done two at a time with staff, as opposed to being done at open meetings? If you can do the budget that way, why can't you do the signs? Or you with? must be somewhat sympathetic to the idea that we just come up with pages this thick on budget items, and it's, it's unwieldy to have the whole group trying to puzzle it through page by page, whereas on a, practically a one-on-one -on -one basis, you can... People, everyone gets a chance to work through it and begin to understand distinctions and the, the, th the thread of the narrative within the budget. But is that not um, information that the public should have? If you're asking yourself about it, shouldn't the public have the right to hear that as well? Well, and I understand that, but one of the, what I've come to realize is the human nature is you tend not to ask um, questions that make you look ignorant of the issue or make you look foolish in a public forum that's being videoed. And so I think it stifles communication. Whereas if we get in these groups and you can sort of let your hair down, if you have some, and, <laughs> and ask those questions and, and feel foolish and have somebody answer it three times before you get it through your head what the answer is. I think that that encourages us to learn and educate ourselves, and and um, so I think the guidance from the law that we're getting is going to stifle that. And I, I don't know the answer to it, but that's that's how we got there. It's not that we didn't want to debate them in public. I just think human nature is such that if you don't understand something, um, you need an opportunity to to do it without being in the full view of the public. <laughs> Alan, it sounds like, in a way, you're saying it's it's murky and it's not it's not strictly against the uh, law. Um, when I spoke with, with the attorney general's office, the the uh, uh, their their position was until we get a complaint and hear all of the facts, we really can't say. But. It doesn't sound like necessarily a subcommittee because there's no charge to go out, fact find, and bring back uh, information. Uh, my my response is that I, I'm I'm not suggesting that board members individually can't have conversations with staff. And if you have a question, and I assume that you're going to get a packet of information, you're going to look through a packet of information, and then you can have a conversation with staff and say, I don't know what this means, and they'll explain it to you. But to have scheduled two by twos mm -hmm. with staff is a little different than having uh, a member of this board 
and and I don't have any problem with the member of this board calling staff and, and seeking help with understanding any particular. And, and we recognize that we can do that, but there's seven of us, and these guys would never get anything done if you know all seven of us. And sometimes you learn from somebody else's stupid question. And yeah. Well, that's true. I mean, if you're wondering about it, um, you probably and I, I, I've lying. heard this in, in elementary school. You're probably not the only oh, one in the room who's wondering about it. Exactly. But someone's got to have enough nerve. Jim? I was just going to say that these subcommittee meetings, uh, the not subcommittee meetings, but these groups of small people to talk about the budget are more about education and deliberation. Mm -hmm. We have other subcommittees like the private way subcommittee, other subcommittees that actually fact find, mull over, deliberate, bring information back to the full board for further discussion. It seems different. The budget to me seems different because it's more education. Mm -hmm. It's staff describing the complexity of, of how the budget is pulled together. And, uh, and described to the board members that they can understand it and ask questions about it. But then those budget, the budgets have been discussed in front of the full board before they're approved. So the yeah, budget meetings, kind of the budget meetings to me seem a little bit different because they're not, um, they're not really deliberative. They're more mm -hmm. educational. Mm -hmm. is, is sort of how I would view them. But you know, that's just my. But they influence your de de deliberations. Well, from you, is the magic word is schedule. So. If I run into David and I'm like, did you really get why we're putting aside this much money for the equity fund? We just happen to have a conversation. That's okay. That's a chance because meeting, it's called. That's, cha that's yes. a chance meeting. But it's not scheduled. Right. But if we schedule the meeting, that's when it enters the open meeting domain, even if we're not a subcommittee. Well, if you called in and said, you know, I don't understand this. Do you want to get together? Just the two of you. I don't have a problem with that. But... But to have a process, a procedure by which the board goes in two by two to staff and has an exchange with staff mm -hmm. about the budget um, seems a little different. It is murky. It is very murky. Mm -hmm. um, and, uh, um, you know, you know I, I'm, a, I'm a mayoral appointee. The mayor has given me my marching orders. The mayor's marching orders to me are we are going to have as open a government as we can. We're going to have as few executive sessions as possible. Okay. And we are going, and um, and so I'm trying to convey that message, right. and, that, we really and that that builds. I think it also builds um, trust in in in, in the, you know the citizens yeah. that you're doing things in, in a very open way. Yeah. Um, you know the the risk is that you all learn all you need to know at these these two two by twos, and you get to the public hearing, you have a an overview of the budget and everybody's happy and nobody's asking me any delving questions because you've already done that in your two by twos. Mm -hmm. yeah, that's a, that's a point. That's understandable. And you know, that's what the public needs to hear. Um, that's my concern. Um, you know that's a good point. Point. and um, so other any number to quorum as long as it's not one, and anything that's not scheduled is a ch anything maybe that's okay. a, a chance meeting. <clears throat> chance meeting. A chance meeting, even if it's a quorum, if it's chance meeting, but you should not be deliberating. I mean, you, four of you can end up in the same room. You know, you're at the, you know, the the high school, you know, uh, choir, and the four of you end up in the audience. That's fine, yeah. but you should not be deliberating against uh, about board business. Um, you know, I, I, I often say to, uh, this is more about hearings than about, about meetings, but uh, to, when I do trainings for zoning and planning board members, particularly who, who hear a lot of, do a lot of um, uh, adjudicative hearings, most of what you hear, you hear at the transfer station. Or you know you're in a small town when you're hearing it at the transfer station, you know you're in a big town when you're hearing it at the stop and shop. Yeah. And, uh, so, and to avoid that, that's what we're trying to avoid is, is you know, taking information outside the public session and deliberating outside the public session and coming to conclusions outside the public session because that's what the open meeting law requires, that the, your, your communications, your deliberations, your decision-making process be public. Deliberation and communication must involve a quorum of the public body. 
Thus, a communication among fewer than a quorum of the members will not be a deliberation mm -hmm. unless there are multiple communications among the members of the public body that together constitute a communication of the quorum members. And, and then the next sentence. Courts have held that the open meeting law applies when members of a public body communicate in a manner that seeks to evade the application of the law. Well, who's that anything about seek to evade? Right. Uh, I'm not saying that you're seeking to evade. What I'm saying is that if the process has the effect of causing you to be making decisions and, and getting your information <coughs> privately, as opposed to in public session, as a group, um, and that's why if you have a, uh, an occasion to call Ned and ask him a question, that's fine. But when it is a process of breaking up and, and, and then the risk, of course, is that Ned's going to communicate or somebody from staff is going to communicate what one group said to another group and now we have the serial communication problem. The same as a serial email, you send an email to Rosemary who sends it to Ned and sends it along the line, you've got an open meeting violation. It's tricky and uh, there's... It is tricky. It is tricky. And, uh, um, it's, you know, <laughs> democracy is, is inconvenient sometimes, but uh, this is what the law requires, <laughs> that this be done, that your, your, your process be open and your process be public, um, unless there is a specific exemption. And so if they choose to have these budget meetings with two people, can we post them? Absolutely. Budget meetings, 8 o'clock a.m.? And then, you, anytime. Anytime. You can do that, and all of you can can show up at that that meeting. I mean, do we? Oh. And once you post it, once you've posted it, it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter anymore uh -huh. because you posted it. You you comply with the law. The downside, of course, is that if somebody sees the posting and wants to come and observe, they can. But the point is, in terms of taking up staff time, that would solve that problem. Oh, absolutely. That we don't have to be But I, I don't see how staff time is taken up less by having five <coughs> meetings with, you know, one or two at a time than it is having a meeting with all of you at the same time. It is a dramatic thing, but it's certainly less than the one-on-one. -on -one that, Correct. That well, I think we were all thinking of this. Uh, and and we, individually, we, we all get stuck at different places in the budgeting, mm -hmm. and it's, you can imagine, it's just much more informative in a tiny group. Because you have to have staff come in here for an evening meeting when they've been here all day, and our financial administrator, you know, could do it within her working hours rather than having more staff to be here for right. four or five hours at night. But you can certainly do it during the day with, with the board to the extent the board is posted. And would we posted. call that, do we have to call that a board of public works meeting, or can we call it a, a, it a financial? Subcommittee to a uh, board of public works. But the whole board is not a subcommittee. Well, I will say that that. For instance, well, we would probably committee. remain in small groups. We just post right. three of them. Right. Not everyone can meet the same day at the same well, time. And we'll call uh, them board of public works meetings. Yeah. Okay. We just don't want to have eight of them. Or seven. <coughs> but we'd have a single agenda of some yeah. work because that's the right. other piece is we have to say what we're going to be talking about. Yeah. You do. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You have to post an agenda. Okay. Did, didn't we do that for the storm order? We did. Yep. Report. The we subcommittee did. meetings that mm -hmm. we posted and met, with, uh, and met I, twice. With, yeah. I, I will say that the school committee um, has a has a budget subcommittee that goes off and meets and reports back to the school committee about the budget. Mm -hmm. And that's another possibility. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I don't think that meet our needs quite the way. Mm -hmm. Because we all are individually responsible for the budget. Yeah. And we're all fascinated. And we're fascinated. Absolutely. Alan, we can do the uh, what if thing over and over again, so I don't I want to put a limit on it. But I got one more I got to ask. Okay. Um, subsequent to um, a meeting we had recently, a full meeting we had recently, I was interested in sending an email out to my colleagues um, building on some discussion that we had had. Um, and I didn't do it pending this meeting, and now I'm glad I didn't. Um, but I'd still like to, and it sounds to me like the best way to do that would be to send it out, 
and submit it to the minutes of maybe this meeting or a subsequent meeting? The Attorney General was going to propose some email regulations, um, and I'm not sure whether they did or not, to tell you the truth, okay. but um, let, let, me, let me get to Ned uh, about the best way to do that. I'm, uh, and clearly there can be, never be a response to an email. Right. Okay. Uh, so why not just send it to DJ as an agenda item? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Or I can just pass it out as an informational item if you're That's not going to discuss to about okay. it. That we go do a go around. Or you can it send it out too as an information. Yeah, item. I wanted to no put a little more thought into it than a go around. Yeah. I'll just write things down. Yeah. Okay. Thanks. Does that then get become part of the minutes that then becomes part of the public record? Like, how do the members of the public then get to see what's in that email? Oh, that's what he's going to tell us. Yeah. I'm just curious. If that's what he's going to tell us. So I don't know when this was from, but this is well, to the Attorney General. Just I mean, of course, she was the Attorney General. That was when the district attorneys were enforcing. It used to be the district attorney enforced the open meeting law. Now, the, uh, as since 2010, the Attorney General is doing that now. So, and. Uh, Copley was sort of the leading district attorney on the open meeting law issues. So she was the middle type. The question was just about incorporating email correspondence into the record of board meeting minutes and guidance on how, how we do that. Um, print them and put them in your minutes. Put them in your record. So uh, in Chris's example, if he sent information out for people not to reply to, but to review and discuss at a subsequent board meeting, Chris's email will be printed and, and made part of the made part of the record, the record yeah, absolutely. The, the meeting minutes or something. But it's crucial that there be no back and forth among four of you. Do not reply. Do not reply. Okay. Thank Any last questions? No. Good thing MJ wasn't here. She's yeah, because that's her seat. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Thank you very much. You're welcome. Next is a contract for Isabella Street sewer replacement with JC. Sorry. Um, I'll bet you guys are here for uh, stormwater flood control and the garage. Rich was here first. Oh. Um, here at the end, just here to listen and observe. And oh, okay. Give you anything out of order? So, I'd like to know if we could take old business number three out of order. So Second. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, stormwater and flood control. Um, we understand, We had a meeting with the mayor this morning, which just touched on briefly. I understand that we're, uh, we will find out tomorrow or the next, or I mean, we'll find out Friday or Monday. But the plan at the moment is that we will have a an opportunity to present to the city council on the 27th at JFK. <coughs> um, Paul Spector is of the opinion, and I think he's winning uh, support for the idea that we should focus on explaining the issues, explaining the costs, and explaining the need to move forward with these projects, why we, why we really feel that uh, the city has to do this. Um, and perhaps that's it. And that, in an hour and a half, with a half an hour, say, presentation, and an hour of questions and, and you know, kind of churning, mm -hmm. that might be a fine agenda. Um, and then at a subsequent meeting, there would be an examination of how could we solve these problems in terms of the fiscal side of it. So at the moment, that seems to be where we're headed. We'll find out for sure on Friday or Monday. That doesn't give us a hell of a lot of time. Mm, no. Uh, Ned and I are going to meet. We're going to meet us. Shortly. Yeah. Well, who's going to do the presentation? When I say us, I mean the, the, uh, this, this committee. We have um, chatted about the possibility that it might be a little bit of me, a little bit of Ned, and a little bit of Doug. We don't, at least in our discussions, we haven't seen a role for CDM at this point. 
my thought is we don't need the how many lineal feet of dike we have and what the slopes are and how many stumps there are per mile. And, and I, I, it, yeah, yeah. So th there may be a point at a later point date where CDM can make a contribution. But oh, I would I would absolutely agree. I don't think that, that, that this is the kind of meeting where we want that kind of information. I mean, the, it's out there if people want to look at it. I don't, I don't want to eat it up with that. I think that this is a meeting where um, what we really need to do is present what we see as the sort of urgent issues that confront us and and gets and, and solicit feedback from people um, what they think we ought to, how we ought to move ahead and 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 not be looking at planning. I think this is way too early in the public's mind to be talking about those types of issues. Mm -hmm. um, I, but I actually think that this is a situation where, you know, um, some really smart discussion needs to, needs to take place. And, and um, I, would never, I would never prepare for myself for a meeting of that type in a, in a two-week time frame. I, would, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't consider that adequate, given, given the complexity and, and the sensitivity of the issue. So I'm, I'm, I'm a little taken aback by the timing of this. And... Uh, well, I just want to say, you know, to, to me, the core single question is what's the alternative? And, and I think that's our point of view is there is no alternative other than forming a utility. Or well, the, the, the idea was that the original question is the Army Corps is asking us to do some things. And the EPA uh, stormwater discharge permit will be requiring right. certain things. And the, we're presuming that the question in the public's mind will be, well, man, that's expensive. What if we don't do it? So that's actually the earlier question. Okay. Be, before we even get to the point of... That's to lead you to what could be the an alternative. And, and we, we see no alternative. Uh, other than the That would be that would be meeting number two where we look at the and it's not a choice, it's a necessity. Right. I agree with your I mean I understand what your comments are, but I, I think from the very moment that I read the, the piece that I wanted to get this out and get it going. And if we think of it as first we say what we're gonna do and then we say how we're gonna do it, we just need to even have the opportunity just to say what we're gonna do and to see what the issues are with the public. So I'm not sure that we we have the report, we have extensive information from that, but we need to know what the, what's going to bubble up as critical issues. So I, I hear totally what you're going to say, but I think this is a preliminary meeting just to get it out there into the public, and we need to do that as soon as possible, bearing also in mind that there aren't a lot of alternatives, but just to see what the issues are. I, I agree with you entirely on that, but I, I, also, I also believe that given the tenor of the times that if we, if the way we approach this is to say this is what we're going to do, we are going to get an unbelievable amount of pushback. And because you're presenting it as a fait accompli to an electorate that's clearly not ready to reach in and pull the sixty dollars out of their pocket. <coughs> so while I, I, I firmly support what you're saying about getting the public education part of it going as as early as possible. I think we need to be really strategic in our approach, and I don't think just sort of laying it out there goes far enough. But, you know, if that's the way it is, it's, that's the way it is. Well, they're going to get back to us Friday or Monday. Uh, they, yeah. Well, my impression based on meetings, other meetings that we've had, is that the whole idea is not to present the issue is a fake accompli. Yeah, right. that's all. That's right. I, I well, agree. And, and, and that's, the, yeah. that's the sense the meeting on the 27th is to talk about the challenges that the city faces in terms of mandates from different regulators and, you know, on the state and federal level, things that need to be taken care of. That'll be all. That'll be discussed for an hour and a half. What are the problems? Yeah. What's the attitude? What are the, what are the costs that the city faces to deal with these problems? And then subsequently the council... We'll ask the board to come back and talk about possible solutions. 
What are the approaches for the city to deal with these problems? What are the tools that the city has at its disposal? Uh, work within general fund budgets, overrides, potential stormwater utility. Don't do anything. What are the repercussions of each one? And then have a discussion and then figure out what the community wants to do. I mean, I think what we've been saying all along is that it's our role to identify the challenges that the city faces. These aren't things that the Board of Public Works is making up or city staff is making up. These are, these are things that are being dictated by federal agencies about what the city's obligations are. What we're trying to do is just identify what are the costs associated with these obligations, what are the potential tools to deal with them, and then let the city council decide, well, okay, well, these are sort of the pros and cons, these are what we need to do. What if we don't deal with the flood control system? What happens then? What if we don't deal with the EPA permit? What, what happens then? What if we don't fix the old city infrastructure and drainage and things? What happens then? Put it all on the table and hopefully, you know, a reasonable solution will be achieved and the city can meet its obligations. But I, I think the, the whole idea is not to say, um, you know, this is the fee and this is what's going to happen because I don't, I don't think anyone's really suggesting that that's what's going to happen at, at this point. I, I, again, I agree with everything that's being said and I know that that's the, the approach we're taking, but I also, I'm also a firm believer that, that words mean things and that, for instance, if what we say is this is what we're going to do, which is the phrase you used, that's very different than um, this is what we're told, we're being advised are the critical things. And the, the, the languaging around this is, is a very important component of the presentation we're gonna make. Mm -hmm. So I'm just, I'm just, I'm trying to be cautious about rushing into it without spending some real time doing what we call message development, mm -hmm. which is how do you, the truth is what the truth is, but, but you sell it in, in a lot of different ways depending on the audience to whom you're speaking. And uh, I just, I just want to be really, you know, aware of that as, as we approach this, because I think that, the, you know, just around what we saw in the water and sewer stuff, there's, there, there's going to be some real concerns about taking on these kind of obligations. And I, I hear exactly what you're saying. The alternative, what is the alternative? Mm -hmm. Yeah. But, but that's but, the second meeting. Right. But I think also the idea, it's like Alan says, we want to have good government, we want to, and we do want to have public input as part of the decision-making process, and that's the attitude we go with. I agree, absolutely. And I get the word thing. Yeah. I, I love yeah. words. I mean, yeah. I do. All right. Ned will tell you I'm forever after him about the way some of his choices. Oh, no, no, no. Should I host a subcommittee you know, <laughs> presentation? Uh, well, you and I should get together mm -hmm. in the next two or three days. Yeah. And we'll let us all know what the upshot of that the meeting is. Okay. The, I mean, if it's going to be on that and what time, et cetera. And that's, it's, and that's to be determined. That's their meeting tomorrow night about that. The city council has asked the joint committee, their their joint committee, subcommittee, mm -hmm. to uh, kind of uh, organize this. And they're going to meet tomorrow night with Bill Dwight and work out some of the details. And Bill is going to be the moderator. Good, Good. Okay. Anything to offer? Yeah. I'll, I'll wait to hear. Thank you, Doug. And then stand in front of the presentation. <laughs> <laughs> no, we have a role for you in mind. Um, <coughs> Move that we take item number two out of the Just order. anything that we could take for you? or Number two. The storm, the storm no. no, no, no. Number but, two, old business. Oh, yes, you want to hear about the garage, right? Perhaps, Perhaps. yes. Perhaps. Could so we have a board motion board. to take uh, old business number two out of order? Second. All in favor? All right. All right. Um, you've all seen, you've, you received a report at this point. I'm not sure if you had a chance to read through it. Um, but basically we have, um, we have some issues to deal with next door and they come with a substantial price tag that the DPW doesn't have the funds for that. Uh, probably with engineering design, construction management, so on, it's probably a, a minimum of a $400,000 project. 
to fix the voids underneath the floor. And uh, then on top of that, we have the cost of the asbestos remediation also. So with the construction, we take care of the mold that's down there and some of the volatile liquids that were found are, you know, they're low key. They can go to the wastewater treatment plant, is my understanding. But they're also going to have to be dealt with as part of this whole void, um, getting rid of the voids under the slab so they can support our city equipment. Um, with it, there was another one that came out today, which I don't think, did they get the one on the lift itself or no? They got a hard copy camera. Okay. About, we basically, we're inoperable next door right now. We have no lifts running right now. Um, it's very hard to work on equipment without lifting them in the air. One of the lifts is actually in a voided area in the barn, in the garage area next door. And that one's been off limits since we found out we had a problem. The other one's a mechanical breakdown that um, Rich has been dealing with. And we're waiting for permission from the mayor to spend, I think, roughly $2,500, if I remember right, to fix the, the major lift that we have. But the whole concept comes back to the fact that here we are. We have a problem next door. We have no funds. Obviously, we're going to be going to the mayor and city council to fix this problem. Uh, I firmly believe that the construction can be done during the winter because it is a heated facility, and time is of the essence, too, to get this done. Um, what we don't need is have another truck fall through the floor uh, with a driver in it or someone standing nearby and getting injured. Um, uh, the, the, it's a pretty fairly straightforward project by cutting out the existing slabs, backfilling in all the voids, removing debris in the voids, backfilling the voids with clean fill, and then putting new reinforced concrete slab on top of it. So basically it brings it back to the same floor elevation, no major changes in the uh, that way you have that structural integrity underneath the floor that we currently do not have. Um, they identified, I, I guess I would call them bays next door. There's two bays in the garage area and there's two long bays, or two long bays in the garage area and two smaller bays in the, in the workshop area where the mechanics work that this needs to be taken care of. And like I said, what I believe is probably going to be about $400,000 and um, you know, the big thing is moving this project forward. We do have to go through Chapter 149 bidding process as part of this, and that in itself is just a time-consuming project. And why is the asbestos and the concrete, where have they been lumped together, the asbestos and the concrete? Um, it was more environmental issues of next door, trying to re remediate them all, all at the same time. And we do have this asbestos issue that's ongoing, and some of it is exposed, uh, my understanding, and and we need to remediate it for our workers next door. Whether it's recovering it or removing it, something needs to happen with it. So it's a minor part of the anticipated 400? It's part of the... It's not in the 400. It's not in the 400. That's correct. But it's something that would have to be done eventually if we're going to use the build. That's correct. There is some... Go ahead. I'm sorry. The uh, time bond had identified that some of the asbestos insulation... Um, is significantly damaged is the way to describe it and that means they're recommending that that be made, uh, abated immediately that other asbestos insulation uh, that's used out there is in fairly decent shape they're saying that that should be maintained in good repair until it's abated when other demolition work or other work in the building is done so at a minimum they're suggesting that the area that's significantly damaged be abated now and this was also, I guess from the way I read it, that it wasn't a full building survey. So they looked at some areas that were identified that were accessible, and they're recommending that a full survey be done for asbestos within the building, which hasn't been done. So it seemed like there was some, still some questions about asbestos within the building. Do you have any thoughts? Well, just a, we are still presently using the building. Mold issue and the asbestos issue don't really go away. They're there. Right now, they're not as bad because the doors are open. But when the doors close in the wintertime, that's when we have the issues, especially in the mechanics main bay of uh, the, the mold issue. Um, other than, I think from an operational standpoint, we're kind of uh, disheveled next door because of this. And uh, my concern is, is that going into uh, winter, while not having the ability to, uh, to park city snow fighting equipment, which is basically every dump truck that we have in that building, plus all our sanders, it uh, really reduces our ready preparedness. 
uh, to respond to storm events because you have to call employees in then they have to spend all this time cleaning off all their vehicles with all the snow and ice um, the other thing too is leaving sanders outside fully loaded um, waiting for you know have waiting and snow falling into them especially when you get temperatures below 20 degrees the actual salt will freeze in the top of the trucks uh, which basically means that all this chunk material falls into your spreader chain, your auger chain, and then the driver has to stop cleaning it out. I mean, it just creates a whole, you know, the, the, the whole host of events that makes the operational end of it very difficult. Um, and the other lift not being operational, the one that's on the um, truck storage side that has the void underneath it, that has created a lot of problems because we it's really reduced our ability to get uh, vehicle maintenance done, uh, especially servicing of vehicles in a timely manner. And not to mention the fact that it's just been a very difficult process because stuff is everywhere. All the, all the equipment is outside. You know, a single dump truck costs $160,000, brand new. They're all outside. Ten wheelers is about $250,000. It's all outside, so it's not, it's, it's not good. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, I'm sorry, Mike. Um, could, could someone speak to how we use the, the garage that we see on this, this sketch? I mean, we've got this big block that's labeled E up in the upper right-hand corner with the two long trenches. It, can we use portions of this this part of the garage for equipment storage? We already do. We already do? So these two long bays that you see here in this figure, these are the drive-through bays that go completely through, and what they do is that they add not park other equipment off the other edges here. Right. So we have, actually, we have... Uh, large trucks, uh, bucket loaders, um, snow fighting equipment like the big uh, auger flights sit on this side. The lift we have, that blue lift you see, in the, the, well the temporary, the, excuse me, the lift that's unoperable right now sits in this bay here. This bay is here are the drive throughs and this is where we keep the sanders and the plow trucks and the sanders full of sand in the winter. So they're the first ones to get deployed and go out. And that way all the other plow trucks can back out after there and leave also. So this area that we're working in, this is probably the most critical area of the barns to have to be able to use. And it's used for storage all winter long, all year round, it's used for storage, equipment storage. And then over on our left, this block C. The, That's this uh, the box, box C is the mechanics bay. Oh, okay. And that's the void where that shaded right, area is. Yeah. That's the stripe side. That's the, there's a void underneath the floor there that has uh, old gear workings from when it was a trolley garage. And that's where uh, the, uh, uh, the main detection of uh, the high count of mold was. And that's mm -hmm. where all the standing water is. It's unfortunate because the high mold counts are where the mechanics are in the storage area uh, where we keep all the equipment is. Uh, those so trenches are drier. Yep. And this other little red box that says... Uh, 1.5 on it. That's the actual other uh, lift that we have there. This little block here, this mm -hmm. little rectangle. That's the other uh, high capacity lift that we have. And that's the one that's currently broken. Broken. It just broke the the other day. But it would be accessible if it was operational. Yeah. Yeah. We just have this void space in front that all the equipment has to drive over to get to it. So then it's not accessible. No, well, no, okay. it is. It, it, it is accessible. But the reason when the building inspector. This originally happened. The building inspector basically told us that we had two choices. Either we don't use the truck side of the bay, which is these two long trenches, right, right. which we are not present. We have some storage in there, but we're not allowed to park any vehicles in there. He suggested either we plate the whole thing temporarily um, or we don't use it. So the cost of the plates was astronomical. So we have, some, we have some temporary plates in there. So all the vehicle maintenance now goes on in here because this floor here presently is much thicker than this floor. Um, but from the, the uh, health uh, and mold uh, aspect of it, it's difficult. So we've been using this one lift to do everything to service uh, about 200 vehicles, uh, give or take. So what would you like from us this evening? Well, um, obviously we need to move forward with it. The time is of the essence, so I guess basically that the, you know, the for the staff to move um, any way possible to get the city council and to uh, uh, support the construction that needs to happen next door in a timely manner. 
and we know it's going to be processed even just going through designer selection of chapter 149 it's going to take months to even get, get through that it's it's just a, a long process it, I, I don't understand this 149 but my question is can you carve out parts of it to be done more more immediately and more urgently like like uh, is there a, like a dollar ceiling under which you could contract no it's work on a public building goes to chapter 149. <clears throat> you could maybe do the asbestos remediation on its own, on a standalone contract on the side, but that doesn't fix the, the critical problem that we're having right now, which is storage of equipment and safe storage of that equipment. So, so when I first read this, I'm thinking, <coughs> if only we had the new building, but the fact is that even if we did have the new building, we still had plans for this old building, and uh, a stable surface is central to any use of the building. So it seems as though fixing this, although it may delay the, our new building even further, it doesn't seem like there's any reason not to move ahead with it. Um, if you're thinking strategically about the, the new building, I don't, if this has to happen. Mm -hmm. This is phase three of what we looked at for our, our future facility here. This was the last thing that happened was yeah. to tear this building down and increase phase one vehicle storage capacity. Yeah. Yeah. So we won't have any of the storage available this winter is the realistic view of this, I would say. Chapter one. We were, we were very lucky last winter when this happened. We had a mild winter. Right. We did keep vehicles outside, yep. um, and we kept the bays as open as possible. I don't know what this winter is going to bring. We can't have the equipment outside, and you know I don't know what the uh, yeah the it's not deemed by Joe Cook at this point an emergency emergency fix. We need to go through the process. So, I mean, it, it just realistically, by the time the city decides how to fund this and we go out and select a designer and the designer does his work and then you publicly bid the job and I mean we'll be lucky if it's fixed a year from now. I mean I don't want to be too discouraging about that. So are there any other like big structures in the city we can talk to owners about using? Like horse barns at the fairground or uh, National Guard building and I don't know. I don't know if there's anything in the city that we could use if, if we truly believe we can't, we shouldn't be leaving our equipment outdoors at the moment. The building next door is unusable? The building is falling down. Yeah. Yeah. So, and, the, and under part of it is all flooded, and so ah. it's, it, they, yeah. yeah. Alright, so for the, for the, yeah, and Jim. Well, well, one thing I just wanted to add, you were just asking, Terry, what, what, are, we, what are we looking for here tonight? I think, you know, the important thing in the summary memo that um, that we distributed tonight, I think, and, and having Rich here, I think it's been a big help because there are challenges that we face here every day operationally that nobody knows about. And we want to make sure that the board's aware of these things. We want to make sure that the public is aware of these things. Rich is talking about readiness in case of a storm event. These are really public safety issues. If we can't get out there and do the job in terms of, you know, sanding roads and doing the plowing that we need to do and there are delays and and all kinds of hang-ups because we've got millions of dollars worth of equipment parked outside in the middle of a snowstorm. I mean, these are really important issues, so people need to be aware of them. There's a lot of things that we deal with, challenges every day, and we do the best we can, and which these guys do the best that they can, but, um, you know, it results in a lot of inefficiencies for the city. We've got, you know, mechanics trying to take care of, I don't know how many vehicles with no lifts. I mean, I hear about these things as these problems come up, and it's, I mean, these are big problems, and, you know, this, these things need to be talked to, you know, Ned will be, you know, he's got plans to talk to Mayor Narkowitz about them and trying to find funding for these, but the need for the new building, you know, was put on hold when, when uh, Mayor Narkowitz became the mayor and other funding issues and things need to be reviewed, and, and I understand all that, but, um, you know, there, there really are issues that are related to public safety here and, and the services that the department provides to the city was severely hampered by working in a building that was built in the, in the 1800s. And I get it that we had plans to store equipment in, in these old barns, but 
you know, I was on that last building committee, at least it was my own personal opinion, that that building should be torn down. I mean, I think relying on that building for another 50 or 75 years, I, you know, I, I question the planning on that and I understand the limitations of funding and maybe we, maybe the city needs to rely on that building. But um, that wouldn't be my first, personally it wouldn't be my first thought that, you know, here's a building that was built in 1890 that, you know, let's, let's build, a, let, uh, the city should build a future around this building when, you know, there are mold is issues, asbestos issues, probably many, many code issues um, associated with, with, with using the building. So I think that was the main thing was to, to keep the board informed <coughs> of the challenges that we're facing here every day. And it's, it's unclear where the money will come from even to do the work. And I think Mike's got a real good handle on the schedule. I mean, it's, you know, on a project of this type, normally when you look at it, you're looking at like a year to get things done. I think that we should move forward. It, the next step is visiting with the mayor and trying to get this on, that the board very enthusiastically proposed that, that, that we talk to the mayor about this and, and that we are endorsing some kind of reaction to this if possible. I really like Mike's idea of also maybe as part of this discussion, you know, look into the places to put the other equipment so that if, you, if we have this new kind of development on the fairgrounds, and I'm not really up on that, but I do know that there is buildings there, and, you know, if they were cost and rental that, the idea that we think it's so important to protect this, and the cost of that would be blank, so that, you know, maybe the $400,000 would look good in, by comparison to get moving the, on the, that. The fairgrounds, the, the, brand, the new horse barns that are there, um, they are new, uh, they are unheated buildings, mm -hmm. so the protection we would have is that we wouldn't have snow and ice on them. The fact is still that after a plowing event, you need to de-ice and de-snow the vehicle. You have to get in an area that they can dry out and we can wash them and clean them. Mm -hmm. And that's what the barns next door provides to us. Mm -hmm. The horse barns wouldn't provide that. We can't throw free, you know, yeah. 20 degrees zero or 20 degrees out and you're washing vehicles it doesn't work. So what you're saying is it would work to protect it in the snow event, but it wouldn't work to heal it. That's correct. It wouldn't. And then also you have the still you have that constant wear and tear on mechanical systems where you're starting a truck at ten degrees or ten below zero, whatever it is, and get that up to speed and running and warmed up the hydraulic systems. Things break down when things are cold, things don't start when they're cold rather than warm. So well, there's just a and time and um uh Weston Sanson actually did a small uh report on that with Lexington and also for Northampton, the cost of leaving equipment outside storage. It's, it's a huge cost. Mm -hmm. It really takes away from the life of the equipment. It's millions over years. And that's why I think that's important information. And even the cost of not protecting the equipment to be part of this $400,000 you have got to look cheap compared to the long-term loss on the equipment. It is cheap. All right, so I, I think it's clear the board supports this. I, I'm not sure that... Uh, motion to that effect adds much. Um, I guess let us know how we can help. We'll do. Thank you. Let's switch. It was up to us. We we'd spend the money. I think I think though from an uh, operational standpoint it's good that the board knows the difficulty that happens with the day to day employees because I think sometimes that's a tad bit removed. Um, just because of the nature of the, your presence and you meet several times a, a month, but you're not here involved in the operations. But it's good for you to hear these things and to see these things, and it's good for the employees to know that you're also extremely interested in trying to resolve these issues as well. So there's been a lot of questions: what's going to happen? When's the floor going to get fixed? And you know, I try to explain to everybody, and you know, everyone understands that a lot. Of, most of them have worked here as long as I have. Things take time. There's a process to everything, um, and it's just a huge inconvenience for us. But I think we have a resolution on the table, and we'll see if we can get it to move forward, and hopefully... And have we explored everything that if there is to explore with the building inspector in terms of regaining at least some access? I mean, would a few more plates for the first 50 feet get us anywhere, or he's worried about the entire bay? They're worried about the entire length of that bay, and the bay adjacent to it, which is cracking also, has some, some cracks in it, but it hasn't completely failed. And now that we've had the barns reviewed by a structural engineer, 
I think the building inspector would be weighing heavily on the recommendations. Sounds like the reinforcing steel was poorly placed. Yeah. I think you'd be less likely to allow us to return to that building yeah. uh, unless, A, the whole place is plated, like the recommendation, or the thing is fixed, which means that we can't even really move in there temporarily. Um, to, to, if we were to at least move, let's say, five sanders inside for the winter. Last year I had the sanders. We put them <coughs> in the large, what we call the marshmallow, which is a large white building. Mm -hmm. um, but unfortunately, the, the sand and salt is in the same building. So... Corrosive. Oh, it it's, is. It's corrosive in corrosive. nature. The sanders were clean when we put them away, and we went up there to pull them out, and everything was just, it was not, it was, it was not good. So, uh, we're just limited because we don't really have any other structures here. The other structures we have are, are not uh, sizable. The vehicles don't fit in them. Mm -hmm. So stuff's kind of everywhere. How much does the marshmallow cost? When we built that, that was about $150,000. That was built in 2003 or four. So we could build two or three of those for the cost of fixing the floor? But they're still unheated facilities. Yeah, yeah. yeah I think my concern, I'm sorry, Ken, <laughs> is that even if we were in, in a perfect situation where we could cut a check for 400000 right now, it doesn't, it doesn't sound, based on what Mike said, and you seem to confirm that it solves our problem for this winter, which is why I, I, I know Rose, you know, initiative is, is a less than satisfactory one, but I am concerned about us, us not being able to do anything for the upcoming season. Um, Ned and I haven't really talked about this, but we have, you know, he's a professional engineer, I'm a professional engineer, we have another professional engineer on staff. It might be possible for us to develop the construction plans for the garage. Um, because like we said, the garage, the, the construction work in the mechanics bay because of the mold issues is something that we're not qualified to, to develop. Sure. The uh, removal of the concrete, backfilling with, uh, with granule material and constructing concrete to fill those, to fill those voids. Not an overly complicated project. Yeah, we can go over that. We, we, might, we might be able to look at trying to do that ourselves within house staff and trying to bid it. Because the problem with 149 is getting a consultant on board. It's going to take, it takes a long time to do it. It's just a process that takes a long time. So if we were just to kind of cut out those two trenches, do the engineering in-house, is that, does the remaining paying contractors come in, pour the concrete, level it, is, does that fall into problematic category? Well, it might take, uh, you know, it might take them, you know, if it took a month to put the plans and specs together and a month to bid it, so it's October, November, award the contract, December, mobilize, should be in January, starting the work. So it'll be midwinter, probably at the earliest, that you might be able to get that done. So, you know, Richie's going to be having his fingers crossed there until, you know, after the new year. But you're saying you wouldn't need Chapter 149 at that point? You'd need Chapter 149 for the bidding. Right. For, 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 for construction, but not for the design. design. Yeah. Right. So it's, you could save a fair amount of time yeah. if we could, you know, find the time and to develop the plans in house. Mm -hmm. The other thing that I find interesting is that the fact that uh, now that we have known that there's a mold issue on the mechanics bay, that uh, it's not deemed an emergency to alleviate that situation which is kind of surprising to me because once the doors close and it, it takes, let's say, a year to do the work, there's a whole other winter of all of us living, mm -hmm. working in there. Because in the wintertime, we live in there, really, to be honest mm -hmm. with you. Mm -hmm. Which is kind of a little, dis it's a little disheartening. Well, well I'm not sure Joe Cook took that in contemplation when we were discussing replacing the yeah, concrete slabs. I have not slabs. had a conversation with him, so I don't, I just, it was the first time I heard of that. You know the the other the other excuse me the other the other thought is is that if we were to do and this is just way out there but if we were to do the do the design work ourselves if we had more staff we could potentially do part of the fix ourselves on, on the vehicle side it's basically just backfilling in each trench compacting in lifts watering it down and six inches of concrete with uh, fabric and rebar but the problem is is that 
the staff we have. We have just enough staff to, not enough staff to do what we need to do. No. Yeah. So if we dedicate a, so if we stop doing right, things right. in the street for a month yeah. to facilitate us to begin you know, the building, it, that's the difficult part. It's because it's, it's like basically building a, it's like almost like building a sidewalk in a sense. You know? I guess another question that you can look at, do we, it, it's nice to have the concrete slabs, but literally could you cut out the concrete slabs and backfill gravel to grade yep. and the trucks would be on gravel grade for the winter? That's a fast, easy is, yeah. remediation approach to it, but it doesn't isn't a permanent fix. No, but um, again, you know, I, I'm I'm really sympathetic to this idea of not betting on the weather as far as maintaining, you know, you know, or preserving the equipment and, and trying to figure out something we can do for this season. So, you know, yeah, it's suboptimal, but it's. <laughs> It's better than where we're, where we're currently standing. Right. It seems to me like if it was backfilled, especially if the top foot was something reasonable, crushed stone or something, you'd barely notice it being inconvenient. I mean, I, I, all right, so just uh, I'm thinking to myself in part, okay, how do I move the meeting along? We'll, we'll, um, we'll, we'll toss these ideas around tomorrow. I think that, you know, maybe there's... Something that'll be easier to get past the mayor, city council. And I also think that Rich was like, absolutely right. That and Rich, we've never met him, Chris. Oh. Hi, nice to meet you. Um, that his point about the mold remediation has to be absolutely has to be in the mix. Um, if we're doing anything, I mean, because when we were discussing it before the meeting, it, it was easy to fold it into this project as it moved forward. But given the time frame, I, I don't think that that's appropriate. I think that it. it Deserve separate attention. If we're talking about even in, 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 the, in the best case scenario, you know, six or eight months from now. So, so with that, it sounds like we might have two separate type of projects: one in-house and one right. Chapter One Forty Nine process that we'd have to go through. I mean, it's kind of a, it's a, it's a, it's kind of scary in a sense to, to get into a project with that depth this time of year. Not being prepared for and being prepared for winter, but having to switch gears, you know, and it's. But I mean, I guess if it needs to get done, and we need to find a way to get it done in the short term, then we need to find a way to get it done. And I guess my point is that we've waited for so long to have this report present. It's finally present, and we know what we have to get done. We have to have some kind of commitment um, from the mayor and the city council to get the project completed in a timely manner, regardless of whether or not we have a new facility or not. The ideal thing would be to say, okay, we're going to build a brand new facility, so let's not worry about the barn floor, and we're going to start the new facility tomorrow. But that's obviously not happening anytime soon. Right. But so. And it doesn't solve your now problem. No, it does so. not. It does not. So. so you'll work on this. It sounds like already we've come up with two or three ideas that might merit further. Mm -hmm. It's not going to be this morning. Finally, that contract for Isabella Street sewer replacement to J.C. Raymakers. Can you say that? I don't know. I can say that, man. Raymakers? Raymakers. Yeah. From the amount of 41600 What was that approved? I have the big You do. Thank you. Take care. Thank you. So this is the work that the board directed uh, the staff to uh, move fast forward on for Isabel Street and the collapsing sewer line that's out there. We had um, a few bidders. Uh, these were the low bidders. We estimated the price, I think, at a little over 50000 and the bid came in at um, forty-one six twenty. So it became below what we thought it would be cost to construct. Uh, we had a total of six bidders on it. Obviously, uh, Ray Mockers was the low bid. And the high bid was seventy-one thousand by JC Construction out of West Springfield, Mass. So I would recommend to the board that they accept this bid and they get the project moving. Mike, I only know of this company as a, as a pavement repair, pavement company. Are you comfortable that they can do 
Dave Valletta did a background check on them and uh, contacted uh, a couple of different references and they came up with flying colors. Apparently there's been utility work uh, on the Berkshires. They were still in a different community, different municipal work. So. Okay, good. Well, we've never done work for them either. We want to make sure that uh, they are capable of doing this work. All in favor of approving this contract? Uh, Aye. Aye. Uh, set date for claims committee next meeting. On 52 Carolyn Street and 91 Bright Street are sewer backups. 126 Deerfield Street, it's actually Deerfield Drive, is a request for an abatement on a water and sewer bill. So do you want to do that? And I can't abate it. Um, this is what we go by. It's basically a high usage bill, and the, the residents claim they don't have money to pay. 26. I think you should leave 15 minutes for each one, so it'd be 4:45. Oh, you do. Think I do believe so. Oh, they're complicated. Well, they're not complicated, but I think 126 Deerfield Drive might take longer than the other two. Uh -huh. So what if we need it? Uh, but the other two are pretty straightforward. 10 minutes, 10 minutes, and 15. So maybe we start at the 10 of 5? Sure. 452. Could be 452. We saved five minutes. Already. <laughs> All right. Great. Um, set a date for street acceptance of Hillcrest. Uh, do, do we want to... Do we have to have a public hearing for that? We do. Do we want to table this? Are we ready for this? As far as I'm concerned, we're ready for it. We have plans that have been approved by the planning board. They've been recorded at the Registry of Deeds. This mimics one of the streets like in 1997 that 51 streets went through the public process one or night or two votes of the city council. Okay. Why this one got left behind, I don't have an no, answer for that. I understand. That. I'm just thinking about the financial side of it. But, uh... Okay. I mean, we can track the expenditures with it okay. if there are any, while we're legal. And um, when we go to the, when I go to city council for that appropriation of money for the private ways, that will be part of that. Just a little background. We had a meeting with the mayor and uh, Bill White today, and I'm trying to get unstuck on this private way thing. Uh, and one issue is that. If, before we get too far into this list, we'll begin incurring costs, mm -hmm. uh, possibly surveyors, certainly legal. And um, I've been making the argument that we should understand how we're going to handle the, the costs, even on the easy streets, like Hillcrest, which everyone agrees would, would cost a minimal amount of money, just a little bit of Alan Seawalt's time, probably. And I was just looking for some clarity on the money before we get into a more complicated street that suddenly is thousands of dollars. This is um, this is the only street at this time that I'm aware of that has <coughs> risen to the top of the easy fruit. Right, but my my point is that that doesn't mean if there's if the money's going to be become important later, I'd rather we don't gloss over the mm -hmm. the small amounts in the beginning. Figure it out and go well, forward. Well, just say so the petition has not be, been referred down from city council yet at this point. So it's premature for us to. And just being proactive on it because I believe tomorrow night it is on their agenda to refer down to planning and board of public works. So we should probably do it in October because we've got the claims committee the 26th. Mm -hmm. For the new kid on the block, what are the other costs associated other than Allen's time? What are the other costs that are potentially associated with something like this? Well, th this particular street was built to all the subdivision standards right. back in 1960. But I'm talking about the less the less usual well, suspects. Some of the streets that were done more casually have no layout. Okay. Um, there are no boundaries for where our easements are, where the center, where the edges of the road are. It's 
So what, that surveying and... Surveying illegal is what we anticipate the other cost being. Yeah. But there's not a requirement for inspections of, like, utilities and... Well, I mean, that'll come up as we go through the process, you know. You will find that most of these private ways have city utilities in already. Them. Okay. Yeah. That's why they want it. But some of them are problematic to accept for other reasons. Okay. Um, I would argue that we want to be careful not to say that any street that has utilities is automatically in. I, I don't think it's that simple. Fair enough. Look at the one in the bottom. Okay, so can we go into October? The first meeting in October? We would meet at 5 o'clock over at Hillcrest? Sure. If it gets passed down to us from the city, I'm sure, we'll which I'm sure it will. Hmm? This is not clear. Right? The thing we're signing says name of company. Yeah. Yeah, I didn't put that together, Dave. The other day. So, we're, sign we're signing the back side of a piece of paper. On the table is the decision on, on a plus order to have that done in October. Yes. Um, so I don't want to handwrite in the name of that company before uh, I leave. I think five would be enough. Okay. It's pretty close by. Okay. So we're going for five, October 10th. Mm -hmm. five. And what we'll do is we will meet at the end up, I guess it would be. Um, Bridge Road? No, I don't want to be done with that. It's a little too fast. Uh, the other end, which is, I believe, Strawberry Hill. Strawberry Hill, right. So we'll meet at the intersection of Strawberry Hill and Hillcrest. It's easier to get there by bike. It is. Okay. That's where you start. Well, start at the bottom of the hill and I'll pedal up from where we do it. Uh, all right, number seven, contract for on-call wastewater engineering services for developing local limits for DOD and TSS to Kleinfelder in the amount of 13.6. Wait, what happened to the generator? Oh, oh I'd already crossed that off, didn't yeah. I? All right, sorry. <laughs> contract for emergency <laughs> generator yeah. repair to yes. FM generator in the amount of 6,500. Um, this is for a transfer switch up at the Leach building that failed, basically, um, if there's a power outage, it does automatically transfer over to power up the leachate pump stations and other facilities that we have online there. So this is an emergency contract that was approved to move forward, um, uh, basically to uh, get this work done, but we do need a contract for it. The leachate building? Yes. The leachate building? building? Yes. <laughs> Which is so currently being decommissioned. So we're fluffing this up for the we storing do. documents? Well, it's also for equipment storage, seasonal school equipment storage, and for record documents of the city. There's kind of a vaulted area, or a, I guess I call it a vaulted area, internal to the building where those records would be kept. But this is an immediate need because if there's a power outage up there, this does automatically transfer over and the leachate pump station shuts down. Uh, so uh, the new generator is being taken out as part of it with a new generator coming in, but this is a interim stopgap that we need to take care of. Right. So the thing is, is that it's going to be operational. It is operational now. It will. Remain it is not operational, operational now. But it will be when we repair this. That's right? correct. But the thing is, is that it needs to remain operational. Yes, it does. In perpetuity. It needs to remain operational until we have our new set generator put in and whatever changes are going to happen. Right, but the thing is, there's always going to be a leachate pump there. There will be. Right, that's what I... I okay. Think that's what On the back side of the landfill, Chris, there's a building that was built... Yeah, I've been there. 20 years ago, okay. Sure. Yeah, 20. So... I guess in the scheme, scheme of things, the 13 isn't a ton, but... Six thousand. I'm looking at the wrong thing. Yeah, 
is after we have the building decommissioned, what happens to the pumping operation? Still continues. So that yeah. that was that was what I was saying. My my point was is that it doesn't really matter. It's not like we're, we're not wasting this money. Right. It's got to be done. It's got to be done. Right. Be but they'll probably do a new switch when the new generator goes in. I don't know the specifics of that right off the top of my head. It's a smaller new generator coming in because we don't need to power a full treatment plant on a backup system going forward. Plus the existing generator up there is 20 years old and um, seeing better days. Well, would it be, I'm not speaking just for myself, but would it be reasonable to make some attempt to make sure that the new switch will serve the as yet to be delivered new generator? That's unreasonable, yes. It might be oversized at that point, but it should be no harm. It's a transfer switch to make power up everything that's out there. Right. And I, I can only imagine that they're using some of those transfer operations going forward, too, because they're going to the same set of pumps. Yeah. Okay. So have we voted? All in favor of approving the contract for the new transfer switch? Aye. Aye. Great. Now, contract for on-call wastewater engineering services. We're developing local limits for DOD and TSS to clamp filter in the amount of 13 seconds. Move approval. Second. Uh, we had a meeting with EPA. They did an audit at the wastewater treatment plant. And one of the things that came out of that audit uh, was the fact that we have really no backup to enforce our local limits and our surcharges for facilities that violate. Uh, the last time this was done, I believe, was in 1990 or 1991. And the EPA wants us to update that. So we asked uh, Kleinfelder to provide a proposal to us to update local limits that are basically defendable. If someone claims that uh, they're not going to pay the surcharge, at least we have sound reasoning why the surcharge is in the place and the value of that surcharge. Uh, Otherwise, not the audit from the EPA went very well. This is one of the things that they flagged. Um. We could maybe talk about it at the end of this discussion, but it does draw my attention to Coke and wonder they we're going to have everything that they needed to know by the end of June. Do we know where we they're did. at? Uh, we did. We met with Coca-Cola approximately a week and a half ago or so and informed them that they needed to move on with their second part of their treatment process. Uh, the last time we sat down with them, they asked about... You know, funding, helping fund the city for upgrades to the wastewater treatment plant so that we were taking care of residual management, sludge management, and so on. Uh, we sat down with wastewater treatment plant staff, uh, myself and Jim, we talked about it and decided that Coca-Cola needs to take care of their product that they're dealing with and their treatment. So we met with uh, uh, the plant manager and uh, Dennis Williams and Rand uh, Hendendolder, who is their SES manager, safety manager. And informed them that, and they were going to get right on it. They have a contract with, I believe it's Woodward and Kern, is that correct? Uh, that they're working with to move the next part of uh, treatment forward, treatment design forward. More than likely, it's probably going to take them a year before it's operational. Um, that was the other thing that we discussed with Coca Cola the way we do projects and bidding and so on. It would probably be three or four years before we came up to speed to be able to do and take care of their needs when they can do it in much less time. We'd it's be truly their expense. a much larger facility. So it's back on their shoulders. I actually sent an email um, uh, yesterday or this morning, I forget which day, I think it was this morning to Ron about a new schedule. Where's that schedule that we talked about at our meeting a week and a half ago? Okay. All right, so on the table is a contract for developing local limits for BOD and TSS. Any further discussion? All in favor of approving the contract? Aye. Aye. Change order number two to contract 08-12 for computer support services to the data foundry in the amount of 8,000. No approval. Second. So this is a long-standing contract. We have a, a data foundry of uh, George Danzinger. He's been our IT person here for probably close to 15 years. We are trying to uh, phase Data Foundry out and have MIS take over everything, and that has not gone quite according to plan. Uh, so with that, um, uh, 
we had two contracts tonight with Data Foundry. One is a year of support services again, which is item number eight, your next item. And this is to get us through billings that happened this past year that we ran up against his contract limits. So we're asking for a 20% increase to $8,000 to uh, take care of uh, what we believe will cover outstanding bills from uh, this past year under his uh, existing contract. We extended the time frame in an amendment a couple meetings ago, but we didn't realize that we had outstanding bills. Right. Gotcha. That's why we did it for zero, just doing an amendment for time, and then we realized there was a okay. few bills that we didn't have. Time. So all in favor of approving the change order number two? Aye. Okay. Then the next issue is a contract for this coming, or the rest of this fiscal year? Yes, that's year. correct. For, FY for support services in the amount of $40,000. This is the same value that was last year, also $40,000. So it, presumably he went, it cost forty eight last year? I mean, yeah, all the numbers aren't in, but uh, we don't believe it will be all the way to forty eight, but it will be close. Mm -hmm. Any thoughts or discussion on All in favor of approving the uh, contract for the rest of this year? Aye. 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 Uh, Earth Center request by the sidewalk chart? This isn't sidewalk chart. This is actually the, it's in your board package. It's actually the painting between the white lines on the crosswalks. Uh, they sent a letter to me dated August 21st. Uh, this was successful, I believe, up in Turner's Falls. They did it where they painted it. Yeah. Oh. It wasn't? Oh, yeah, I, yeah, it was because I printed out the Arch PDF. Out. Mm -hmm. I usually look at all, and that did, I mean, I was like, knowing that we didn't have minutes, and then I, yeah. we did, that's right, right? Yep, that's we right. Yeah, no. I didn't get a package. I, you didn't get a package? I don't think no. I did. Because I was looking I for the minutes because I missed yeah. the last part of the last meeting, right. and also I got was the agenda. I got an agenda email from the review of all that. Right, yeah, yeah. I got an agenda, and I got the, uh, the Ooh. flood thing from yeah. Jim. Yeah. Well, we apologize and we will send it out for the next board meeting. Okay. So on table, or want to tell us about it? Well, I can tell you about it. Basically, the Arch Night Out has requested that um, there's uh, three crosswalks that they want to paint. Uh, these are painted between the white bars that we have for pedestrian crossings. One at Center Street adjacent to First Churches. One on Old South Street adjacent to Iris Photo and Digital. And the other one being on Crafts Avenue in front of a store called Unite. Um, they believe it, that the project will strengthen the link between our community and the arts. And um, they will act as additional as traffic calming devices slowing down the busy streets in Northampton. So, uh, like I said, up in North Adams it was, not Turner Source, North Adams, they um, actually painted a series of fish patterns. But they had two longitudinal bars for crosswalks instead of our ladder design. Mm -hmm. So there's a modification of that they want to do, but they were looking for permission to move forward um, on these three crosswalks as an experiment. Would that mean that, I'm sorry, can I ask a question? Absolutely. Would that mean that they would want to do more? They may come back with a future request. Okay. I assume depending on public input to the process, uh, not the process, but the design and what happened and the likability of it. Is there someone on Elm Street interested in Gary, or...? Well, I think it sounds, it sounds, I haven't seen Something the pictures, well sort of exciting. Right? My only concern is uh, how this is going to work with traffic control. I mean, we don't want permanent tra uh, traffic calming in those areas, so... I mean, my there's a lot of traffic going well, on Avenue. Well, let's put it this way. If they painted the pavement like we paint our crosswalks and plowing, yeah, it's going to be done in a year. It'll be faded away. Yeah, but when DPW ha does, does traffic painting, it's for uh, safety purposes. That's correct. And on something like this, which I love the idea, but it, I, I'm worried about it. Holding up traffic. 
for not safety purposes. You're talking about during the installation. The, the installation, yes, exactly. Yeah. I'm, I'm just curious what they're going to paint. You said it's actually in between the bars? Yes. So the white stuff will remain white. Yes. So if the coloring going in between the bars is not white, something darker, I don't see how it would be a safety issue. That was my first thought. The second thing is, I don't know how long they're taking to do it. Are they doing stencils? And maybe it's really quick. They didn't get into details of how they were going to do it, but they gave some photos of... Uh, what was done recently, like I said, up in North Adams, and uh, they were hoping that they'd be able to do some of this in Northampton. Do you have any concerns about, I mean, whatever they paint is, it will be lighter than the pavement, so it'll tend to decrease the contrast of the white stripe black, white stripe black. That's a possibility, yes. Well, and that's, that's really the, that's and it's really bound the to be overspray into the white. Yeah. Well, maybe unless they're using stencils and they're masking. They're using brushes, looks like. Oh, they're using what? Brushes. brushes, stencil and brushes. Yours is much clearer than mine. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yes. I, I guess I have the same thought that drivers everywhere are accustomed to a black and white pattern as a sidewalk, and it's a safety feature. And as we start to change that appearance, are we detracting from that message? I mean, it doesn't is leave it, as quickly. Or are we distracting the driver from looking around to see what the pretty picture is in the sidewalk? Or, 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 <laughs> are, are, we, are we doing a, a, a um, positive benefit in that distraction in that the driver slows down because they don't understand where they just arrived, which is a strategy that Nelson Nygaard described when you just, you remove everything and you drive into a plaza and people just come to a stop because they don't know what to do. You put benches. Or, <laughs> you put benches in the middle of the intersection. I'm not saying. It. I'm just saying that gotcha. it may not be. But that's exactly what my question was. Really, is like, what are they going to do, and how might that uh, interfere with the purpose of the surface markings that are right. there, which is public safety. Have we given you enough guidance? What? Uh, <laughs> I, have, I actually have a guide. Most of all, questions. I have a guiding comment. Okay. Why not call the guys in uh, North Adams or wherever they did the Turner's Falls, Turner's Falls Turner's in North Falls. Adams, and call uh, DPW there and just see if they have any comments on what happened. So sure. when were they hoping to do this? Is this uh, something they'd like to start advertising? They didn't say give a time frame. They were looking to do it. They just wanted to uh, basically for the past and look to get information as an experiment. We we'll do a motion uh, that says pending staff consultation with other communities. Sure. I'll make that motion. Second. I don't think we have another motion on the table, so. Right. What's your motion? That we'll approve, we'll approve the request pending staff consultation with communities where they've already done this regarding uh, traffic safety. Favorable feedback. Can I yeah. add to that? Sure. And we do a small mock-up of what they propose to do so we can see if it's on a city street next to one of these bars, but not necessarily out in the roadway. Maybe between the curb and the first bar, between the first and the second bar, just one area that's mocked up so everyone can get a sense of what they're really talking about. I'm good with that. Okay, so staff making some calls and these guys doing the mock-up for us to see, everyone. Thank you. You want something like, what's the mock-up? Instead of going all the way across the street, just do the first two or three. Well, in front of you, know, you know, just hand do a brush. A small to scale sample section or something? Or? Yeah. No, do like more. the first three bars near I'm the curb. I'm saying one bar. You've got, oh, just you've one got bar. a curb, you've got a space, you've got a bar. The next bar. I don't think the bars are going to be part of the game plan here. I think you're only going to have sort of a long, the long stretches of the ladder, not the, not the ladders. I don't think those are going to be there. My, my well, I think you're going to go, go from curb to curb. I'll withdraw it then. The, the here's, here's down the street. And I can't see what street that is. I mean, there's no ladders. Let's say there's, there's across the street. No, there aren't. They have one between the bars. Yeah, just the one between the bars. Can I so pass this around? Yeah, because well, this one, the, it doesn't show in the other picture. So these are the bars that we have. I'm imagining their artwork is in here. Look, there's a ring. You can make some artwork. Well, I don't know if they're going to use green. Confusing. But I like the way the 
the green marks. The ones they did in the other towns. I mean, I don't know how to get rid of the bars. Oh, look at that. That looks cool. Well, they have longitudinal bars, so right. there's a whole canvas right. well, for them to the, work the, with. That's yeah, I mean, the issue is that our bars aren't like that. With that showing as far as this way, they did a pattern. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. These are great. Yeah, I like that. <laughs> Let's just change all of our cross. <laughs> I second that. I'm withdrawing the motion. How about if we talk them into doing all of our bars in like this pop art thing where it's just these big long white rectangles with space in between? With that all special paint city. that lasts. Well, could we, that, Chris, how about if we ask them to do just one? Do we even want to go forward with this right now? Why don't I talk to the other two communities yeah, first? Let's, like get more, let's get more information. Yeah. Yeah. More information. Yeah. How about we table this? Yeah, yeah. 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 great. Yeah. 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 That would be awesome. Try and help somebody. Okay, next is private ways. We've got the. Um, how do you do that? Yep. Yeah. You're making some progress. It seems. Tiny, a tiny, you know, step by step. Um, so I, I guess what we're exploring is to begin to make some real progress on it. Be able to show to the public that ones we've, you know, we're one at a time. We're beginning to work on this, and um, just go through another winter without much more than that. Uh, the city council is um, would entertain a uh, a proposal from the Department of Public Works to put aside a certain amount of money for the process. Uh, they're asking us to come up with more information and make a more specific proposal as to how much money and why we think that's the right uh, or a reasonable amount of money to begin the process. Um, <clears throat> as you saw, we just uh, set up a meeting for Hillcrest. Um, so that's kind of the, the broad outline is there seems to be agreement that this is something the city should just pay for. It's a shared responsibility, the roadways. Uh, the idea of trying to go back and collect money from each owner of property along a private way just, it becomes a nightmare. Um, apparently, if there is an abatement, property owners can say, I'll just pay for it right now. I don't want to pay any interest. Other people can say, oh man, I'm on a tight budget. I need 10 years at least. And apparently, you could say, no, I only need five. It's just, in every street will be a little bit different. Some streets will be relatively inexpensive. Some might be, you know, like the most expensive of the group. Um, I think there's broad agreement that it makes sense to just treat it like we treat everything else in the streets. Uh, the cost of plowing, the cost of sanding, the cost of whatever is shared throughout the city. Um, the other thing that has come up is <clears throat> we're talking about just going around maybe Ned and myself and Amy also might be interested um, to just look at a few of the streets before we get too far into the process. Um, I'd like to pick some example streets and, and more concretely think about what would it take to move this street forward? Mm -hmm. What do we have? What do we need? Just in the process of coming up with a dollar figure for the city council, we need to some concrete examples. Hillcrest, we know, but I think that's the only one we've got a, much of a handle on. I found a couple of layouts um, at the Registry of Deeds, like Carpenter Avenue has a layout that was proposed. Service Center has a layout. Um, there's a few of them out there. We need to find one that doesn't have a layout. There's plenty of those too. Right. We need. I mean, we need to pick something that would be a good example of what might be involved to take a, a tougher street. Um, and then there are a few which we may, that we are currently plowing that it seems reasonable to think we might decide to stop plowing. So I had suggested that we do a drive around to like maybe just a dozen streets that look like they have these, what everyone's calling the low-hanging fruit. And I wonder whether Gary or anyone else might be interested in that. Just not a meeting. No, we're just looking at private property. Perhaps you could do a videotape. Maybe? Maybe Mary's available. <laughs> 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 
<laughs> this, this could be fun. Yeah, never know. All right, so so we'll try to do that perhaps uh, sometime next week. Sure. Is there a day that's better or time frames that are better? First thing in the morning versus afternoons? Tuesday's out for me. Okay. Uh, how early in the morning? Uh, we can start 7 o'clock if you want. That would work great for me. Yeah, I'm fine with that. Okay. Uh, let me throw. Let me see my calendar. I'll, I'll right. send you an email with some dates and times to the three right. of you. So I we I imagine this is a prelim, you know, just a little preliminary look see. So then we would come back uh, to the board with a more concrete idea. For example, how do we tackle those streets that we suspect may no longer receive service? And maybe you could also say what streets you're going to look at and tell you because we can't. Make it, but we could right. keep it in mind. Okay. Yeah. Downtown. That's what yeah. I would do. Yeah, that would be great. Okay. Yeah. So I do have a package of <clears throat> every one of these streets and how they look like on a small locus in the neighborhood. And actually, I can give you copies of that and you can write your own little notes on each one of those. That way you have. Okay. Great. There, on the information that you sent out on that, there were some streets that are private ways that are. I don't think we're doing anything on them. That's so correct. I wasn't sure why those were in the list, because we're not going to do anything, right? They are in our inventory of private ways. Okay. But they're and the thought process was that we would just send them a letter just reconfirming that we aren't doing anything with your private way and don't ever intend to. Right. That way they're treated with some form of process. Yes. Okay. They're in our inventory, like all and the courtesy. others. Right. I mean, just got Private ways, just private ways. Some are no-brainers. The sign says private way. Well, some of them say private way, and we are plowing them. Oh. Some of them don't say private way, and we're not. Yeah. And they are private way. So I was just wondering if we're plow if we have been plowing some of these that we're dropping. Yes. Yeah. And does it, have we told anybody yet? Or? No, I I I just that, that seems messy. Well, here's the plan. We just take a, a, a quick look at these, mm -hmm. make sure that. Uh, we more or less agree on which ones to bring forward. And then I propose that we notify the homeowners of, of what we're thinking and schedule a, an actual hearing like the one on Hillcrest where we all go stand at the end of the street as a group and hear what the neighbors have to say. And then, you know, as, and so it's a, the, there's a process. I'd just like to pick some candidates that we can start with. Sure. But if I hear what you're saying is if somebody's going to get cut off in this winter, you, you probably owe them an explanation so they can make plans. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. So no, this will be no deliberation. We're just taking a look. Okay. And the deliberation will occur at a, a meeting. We'll schedule a hearing. We'll stand there, meet the neighbors, hear what they have to say. All right. So that's the real decision point. Yeah. So to speak. Right. And, and typically, the way those hearings go, we just listen, we absorb, we look. And then we make a, an actual decision later. And at this, in this case, that decision would be to recommend to the city council that the street be accepted or not accepted. Well, I guess if, the, if we... They have to petition at first. Yes. And if we don't think the city council should approve it, no action on our part is required. Uh, you would make a rec recommendations. If they petition, comes down, the board would make a recommendation not to accept. And then it would be up to the city council to decide. It. They have the final say. Yeah. But we just got to break this. I mean, we got to get something more. Baby steps. Baby steps. Okay. So, the old things. Uh, solid waste planning update. So, yeah. Um, so there's a potential that the that little reuse center that we've been trying to get going will happen in the floor and civic center. Even though they're, the city's trying to maybe get rid of the floor Florence Civic Center, but it's at least a start. The advantage is that MJ, it has her Habitat for Humanity uh, office there, so that she has a little oversight capability. It, it, you know, the committee um, that meets once a month is very active. They've started a Facebook page. It, it's gotten tons of hits and responses. It's sort of an exciting thing because it's building momentum on that. And I get way too many emails now. Um, this Friday, this Saturday, there's a rigid plastics event. 
there's a event scheduled for the next four months this, um, as well. And then one in October is uh, then I think with uh, JFK and is using artists to come and use um, uh, uh, build item build pieces of art out of leaves. So so there's a lot of sort of good things happening there. There you know it's not critical, but it, you have to start someplace. So you had a nice mailing. Yeah, that was very nice well mailing. Mm -hmm. That was good. Nice and concise and easy to follow. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. All right. Thank you. A couple things on solid waste. Um, we have issued a request for proposals for hauling and disposal of solid waste and recyclables from transfer stations. That's sort of a part of getting actual bids in from contractors to figure out what the real cost would be to privatize those services. We had one of the board subcommittees looking at evaluating what transfer stations does the city want and how are they going to be operated and what are the costs going to be. So we have that on the street. Bids are due October 3rd, I believe. So we'll have that information shortly. Um, we had a pre-proposal meeting this morning with um, engineering firms uh, regarding the design of the base wall landfill closure. So we're obligated to have a contract by the end of October with an engineering firm so we can start the design for the closure of the remaining open area of the landfill. <coughs> that project needs to be completed, construction needs to be completed by October 15th of 2013. So we're kind of on a on a timeline and a schedule to sign a contract and get that project moving forward. So it's moving ahead. We had talked about reconvening our committee on transfer station operation after the closure of the landfill. I think we talked about doing it in October. I don't know if we this want October? To. Yeah. The timeline would be good. I mean, after the bids are received. Right. Mm -hmm. So we can either pick a date now or wait till the meeting on the 10th maybe. And maybe MJ will be here because she was on that group. Mm -hmm. It's the three of you, isn't it? Right. Mm -hmm. right. So why don't we deal with it on the 10th? Maybe even on the 25th? That's how Mike's a get her done kind of guy. You don't just... Yeah, just We're running out of time here. We've got a lot of things to do. The 26th September is what I'm saying. Oh. oh. <laughs> that 26. <laughs> I was with you. I'll tell you why. That might not work. You might not be there. I might not be at that meeting. Where will you be skiing, Mike? I will not be skiing anywhere. I might actually be working. Oh. It could be the day this week we have to work. Okay. 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 Gary, Anthony? You, you said the Florence Civic Center? Did you mean the, the community, community center? I meant the community okay, I was center. trying to figure I'm sorry. that out. I meant the community right. center, the old school. Right. Yeah. Okay. I'm okay. Okay. Anthony, you'd like to talk about mm -mm. No? I'm good. All set now. A couple things in your board package, some awards of some they student. Didn't get. We didn't get a package um, in here. Well, let me get it. We'll be sent. I can picture it. will all be resent to make sure that you get it. And uh, I take it they didn't get their thing about the I consolidation guess. committee. 1959, when I was reviewing private ways, I came across this March 23rd, 1959 meeting minutes of the consolidation committee that would look at consolidating the Department of Public Works that formed our department as it speaks. That's kind of interesting history. Yeah. Yeah. Cool. They will be sent <clears throat> shortly. So you'll see it in your next package. But don't reply. <laughs> <laughs> That's it. Um, I guess in regard to a couple of the items that Ned wanted to talk about was regarding the Ford Stewart Ford Stewart plan grant money. So we had a couple of checks in the mail. But while well, I'm thinking of it, um, Nicole Sanford was on the radio on the Bill Norman show talking about Ford Stewart plans and some of the initiatives that we've talked to the board about. Mm -hmm. So she was on there with Mike uh, Maury, the forester, talking about some things with Mary Suarez. So. Well, the podcast will be up on the website there if you didn't hear when she was on. But right, she was on, I think it was on about a week or so ago. Okay. But, yep, that's all I got. Um, just the board knows we're currently doing center line painting of roadways, and we're actually doing some uh, asphalt work on Loudville Road, North Loudville Road, doing some uh, push box, we call it, basically skim coats of roadways. 
So we're trying to address some of Aurora's internal to our department rather than a bid and an expensive contract, just so you're aware of that. I, I have my, uh, we had the meeting at City Hall today and I, I dragged uh, Ned and Jim over to one of my pet peeves, uh, road cuts for uh, trenches that aren't backfilled properly. And um, I, I just, it just kills me. And I, I you know, I admit, I, maybe I'm using my position on the board to make something of nothing. And if so, just slap me around and tell me to stop. But it just looks like some of these road cuts after a little while are just falling apart. There's grass growing in the middle of the street around the corner from my house. You can see gravel. And it's a gas company trench that was improperly backfilled and they used a different asphalt, different aggregate size. The whole thing is a mess. So I was, I keep, I, you know, what, what I was asking Ned and Jim was, isn't there anything we can do? We just have to for 250 bucks, they get to dig a trench. It falls apart fairly quickly, and that's the it. The integrity of the road. Where yeah. Those, where and, ways to... and we're not going to go back and repave these. We're letting them do this to our road stock with no oversight and no consequences. I, I don't know. Ned. So part of that discussion today that we had out in the field on uh, East Street, it was was uh, looking at, um, right now the only hook we have is a five-year envelope that we can require the contractor to go back there and fix the trench. It's always been an issue trying to deal with staff and actually overseeing the construction process to make sure the work is done right in the field. So what we thought about is uh, looking at our list that we have each year generated trench permits and go out there at year three into the five-year process as a drive-by and just flag the ones that are issues and get the contractor on board to fix them again. Um, that's what we kind of talked about today out in the field, but that would be a policy decision by the board also, just so you're aware of that. So I'm going to ask to craft some language. Well, I get, and at this point I'm wondering, if, does that seem reasonable? Yeah. Oh, yeah. And if it works any point. Yes. Right here. Right here. Well, I was just going to say, uh, I'm not sure how you enforce that. How would you Tell the contractor that it's just Never totally issue. a gas thing. If they don't want to fix it, then we would not issue them a future permit. Okay. I mean, likely you get cooperation because most of the people doing road cuts are limited to a few, a few contractors and a few utility companies probably. I mean, Bay State Gas is our biggest digger of the public ways. Right. Well, I'm, I'm good. Yeah. Okay. Well, if that's okay, I... I said, well, would you guys just think about it and maybe bring something to us? Like, it, it, it may, for example, require adjusting the permit fee. You put in an hour or, you know, some dollar amount for the inspection, but then we have to do the inspection. Mm -hmm. okay. Move your agenda. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Thank you, everyone.